multitude who shall come from the grave at his second coming. He approaches the Father with whom there is joy over one sinner that repents. She continues, the Father and the Son had united in a covenant to redeem man if he should be overcome by Satan. They had clasped their hands in a solemn pledge that Christ should become the surety for the human race. This pledge Christ had fulfilled when he upon the cross, he cried out, it is finished. He addresses the father. The compact had been fully carried out. Now he declares, father, it is finished. I have done thy will, O oh my God. I have accomplished the work of redemption. If thy justice is satisfied, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. The voice of God is heard proclaiming that Jesus, justice rather, is satisfied. <laughs> the Father was pleased. Beloved, there is no reason for you and I to go to hell. None. There is no reason for anybody to go to hell. God's justice has been satisfied. Jesus satisfied the claims of the law for the wages of sin is debt. And Jesus paid it all. He paid it all. So he ascended. Now John was given a picture of the scene as everything was now set for the inauguration in heaven. When you get to Revelation chapter 4 verses 1 through 8, you see that a setting was in place waiting for the inauguration to take place. When you read Revelation chapter 1 to verse to chapter 3, what you find, John is in spirit, the Bible says, on the Lord's day. But John has not yet been taken to heaven in vision. He's still on earth. When the Bible says he saw Jesus walking amongst the seven candlesticks, that was not in heaven. That was on earth. Because the seven candlesticks represents what? The seven churches. So he was still here on earth. It was not until you get to chapter 4 when the Bible says, After this I looked and behold a door was opened where? In heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said what? Come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So if he was already up there, <laughs> the angel, would, the voice would not have said, come up hither. But no, it says a door was open. Which door do you think this was? The sanctuary door. <laughs> the sanctuary door. Because something important is about to take place. And John must see it to record it. Now, it says in verse 2, And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. And one sat on the throne. Who do you think that was? God the Father seated on the throne and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto emerald and around about the throne were four and twenty seats and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white and they had on their heads crowns of gold Verse 5, and out of the throne proceed lightnings and thunderings and voices and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. That's the picture of the holy place now. These seven lamps of fire burning. Now he's getting a glimpse of the holy place. But look what he sees next. I'm telling you. Dazzling creatures. He said that he saw now in verse 7, and the first beast was like a lion. The second beast like a calf. The third beast had face as a man. And the fourth beast was like a what? A flying eagle. Now there have been much, I wouldn't say speculation, but much interpretation about 
these four creatures and their appearances. Lion, calf, face as a man, and flying eagle. Now, I've used the scriptures to, 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 to identify these four creatures with their characteristics. And I believe that they resembled our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, in character. So in other words, they take on the characteristics of Jesus because he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 5. The second one is a calf. Represents the sacrifice of Jesus Christ because the calf is used as a sacrifice. And when John saw Jesus in John chapter 1 verse 29, he says, Behold! The Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And of course, the face of a man. This represents his humanity. You find in Hebrews 2 verse 14 where it says, For as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself likewise took part of the same. And of course, the flying eagle. This shows his compassion. His protection, sister. Exodus 19 4, where God said, I have borne you up like eagle's wings. So they take on the characteristics of Christ. Verse 8 says now, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him and they were full of eyes within and they rest not day and night saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So the scene is now set. We haven't seen yet Jesus in chapter 4. Did you notice that? The Father is there. The 24 elders are there. The four creatures are there. But where is Jesus? He's not there yet. You see, the stage is set for him. That's where now you plug in Revelation chapter 5, the next chapter over. This is the inauguration chapter. He's already ascended, he's present. He's not there. Watch now. What is the word inauguration? It's, it functions as a noun. It means the act of inducting into office with solemnity. Investiture with office by what? Appropriate what? Ceremonies. So there was a ceremony that was about to take place. Follow with me now in Revelation 5, 1 to 12. We won't read the entire thing, but we will capture the important verses. The Bible says in verse 1, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, in the hand of the Father, a book written within and on the backside sealed with what? Seven seals. So this book had writing within and it had writing without. It was like a scroll. Written within and without. And we're told that that scroll contained the history of the human race. The history. Watch now. Verse 2. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? John heard this. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look therein. I wonder why no man in heaven nor in earth was able. Do you ever think of it? Why? Because no man has been what? No man has done the sacrifice, all right? Anyone else? I hear, all right, and I hear no man is worthy. But the next verse over tells you, you know. Look at the next verse. John says, I wept much. Because what? No man was found what? Worthy. <laughs> no man was found worthy, beloved friends. We are not worthy. None of us. So we, we are not to walk around thinking that we are good. We are not worthy. We are not beloved friends. 
There was a book in heaven that needed to be opened. And John, they looked in heaven and in earth. Not even the saints that went to heaven with Jesus was worthy. They weren't worthy. Not one elder. But in the midst, hallelujah, one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed to open the book. Weep not, says the strong angel, the elders rather. The lion, the tribe of Judah, the root of David had prevailed to open the book. Praise be to God. And he took the book. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts and elders, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. Having seven eyes and seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. So in the midst of the throne, there was a lamb as it had been slain. This is Jesus Christ, the lamb of God, to take away the sins of the world. Verse 8, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the elders and the lamb having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Look at verse 11 now. And I beheld and lo, and heard the voice of who? Many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was what? Ten thousand times, ten thousand times, thousands. A hundred million. Present. Now, I want you to think about the scale and the size of the sanctuary. What's the capacity for in here? 300, 150? Huh? 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. You can't even put a number to this because 10,000 times 10,000 is 1 million. But then it goes on to say thousands of thousands. So the scale of the sanctuary in heaven, it's probably the whole heaven itself. <laughs> it's huge, beloved friends. You know, we paint these little miniature pictures just to give you a visual. But we have no idea of what the, that, that thing is in heaven. We don't know. I see your hand. Let's, let's take the mic, please. We have no idea. Go ahead, my sister. Amen. You say it's huge in heaven. Remember, Sister White said, there's a table that is long. All right. The fruits, we, the, we can't see. If God's going to let us see. Even if you're way at the end, we're going to see who's at the end of the table. Amen. And God, Jesus himself, is going to serve us. How precious that is. Hallelujah. So it's no longer 2020 vision. It's now perfect vision. Perfect vision. You can see from one end to the other. Praise God. So what those of you who are now wearing glasses, <laughs> there will be no more glasses there. Praise God. Amen. Verse 12 now. Saying with a loud voice. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, and glory, and blessing. This is a celebration taking place in heaven. Now, what was happening on earth while they were celebrating in heaven? Remember, Jesus spent 40 days here on earth. So, what were the disciples doing while this was happening on earth? This is now where you plug in Acts 1, 14 and 15. The Bible says, they are continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. So while this ceremony was happening in heaven, the disciples were on earth praying. They were in one accord. And the Bible tells us the number of them were about 120. It was present at the time, a small group. Right? Now, 
This is important, beloved friends, because the inauguration sets the stage for Pentecost. She says, Southern Word, November 28, 1905, the Holy Spirit speaking to Mrs. White, for 10 days, the disciples offered their petition for the outpouring of the Spirit. Now let me pause there. 40 days Jesus spent here on earth. So 10 days leading up to the 50th day, Jesus was already in heaven. But he didn't, he didn't present himself into the inauguration because it had to take place on a specific day. So they were praying for 10 days. Now look what happened now in Acts chapter, one, Acts chapter 2 verses 1 now. And when the day of Pentecost was what? Fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Look what happened. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Oh, I would have loved to be in that room. You imagine you're in here now and you just hear a sound. Just going by your ears. You can't see it. The only thing, the only thing that you, you can only hear. But that was the Spirit of God moving in that room. And it filled the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. Beloved friends, let me tell you, you see, this experience will happen again. And it will happen with greater power and force. Greater manifestation. But the sad thing is, she says, many have not yet experienced this first outpouring. And in vain, they are waiting for the second outpouring. The second outpouring will do us no good if we have not received the first outpouring. She says that. And we've studied that here. Now, this is where Leviticus now, 23, 15, and 16, find its primary root in regards to the context of Pentecost and the wave sheet and, and the 50 days. Watch what now, what, what the Bible says now in Leviticus 15. The Bible says, and he shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath here is in reference to the, the ceremonial Sabbath, which is the Sabbath of unleavened bread. Because remember, Passover took place on what date? The 14th. That was the Friday. Unleavened bread took place on the 15th, which was the Sabbath. The wave sheaf took place on the 16th, which was Sunday. So the Bible says the morrow after the Sabbath, which is the 16th, from the day that he brought the sheaf of the offering, seven Sabbaths shall be what? Completed. Now, I want you to notice something how the Bible, I just love the scriptures. And that's why we have to study and not just read. Look what the Bible uses. The Bible uses seven as a cardinal number. What am I saying? Seven Sabbaths. Seven, seven is how much? 49. So you're going to count seven Sabbaths, which is 49 Days. So he's using cardinal numbers in the context of quantity. Because that's what the cardinal is. It's showing how much. It's 49 days. Now look at verse 16. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath. So the scripture now switches from cardinal to ordinal number. Now the scripture is showing position. 
within the seventh Sabbath, you're going to look to the seventh Sabbath, which is position. Look what the scripture says now. So you're now going to number after the seventh Sabbath, which is the 49, because there are seven Sabbaths. So 49 days, that Sabbath that follows, now you're going to number 50 days, because you're going to add one to the 49. So now you have 50 days, and he shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. That's why the Bible was so specific when it says in Acts 2, 1, that the day of Pentecost was fully come. So in other words, sister, the 50 days had arrived. It had fully come. They couldn't do it on the 49. They couldn't do it on the, the 48. It had to be the 50th day. Pentecost. Now, in the Old Testament, Leviticus, it wasn't called Pentecost because Pentecost is a New Testament word. Right? It was called the Feast of Weeks. Weeks. Because it was seven weeks. 49. The Feast of Weeks. But in the New Testament, they plug in the 50 because it's 50 days later. Pentecost. That's where they celebrate the wheat offering. They brought in the wheat. Remember we talked about, we talked about the, um, the rainy season? How that it was important for the rain to come, the early rain? Because if the early rain doesn't come, the latter rain wouldn't do no good. In agricultural circle, it's the same thing in the spiritual realm. You have to receive the early rain before you receive the latter rain. Because if you plant the crop, and it doesn't receive the early rain, the latter, it won't even germinate. Because the early rain germinates the seed and the latter rain brings it to fruition. To perfection. She says, the Pentecostal outpouring was heaven's what? Communication that the Redeemer's what? Inauguration was accomplished. I'm not just pulling this out of thin air, beloved friends. It is Bible-based. It was accomplished according to the promise he had sent the Holy Spirit from heaven to his followers as a token that he had, as a priest and king, received all authority in heaven and on earth and was what? Anointed one over his what? His people. Now let me hasten on. Now, in Leviticus chapter 1 verse 9. Hebrews rather, thank you. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 9. Does all this fit? How does this fit into the type? Now the Bible says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, had anointed thee with the what? The oil of gladness. This was the inauguration that took place in heaven. This was Christ's anointing. This verse. The inauguration that took place in heaven. He had to be anointed. Now in Hebrews chapter 5, 4 and 10, I want you to highlight these two words. Notice what the Bible says, and no man taketh this honor, meaning the priesthood, unto himself, but that he that is called of God as was what? Aaron. Now the inauguration in heaven anointed Jesus as king and what? Priest. But there is one thing we ought to keep in mind. Though he is king, he is not yet functioning as king. You get that? He's anointed king, but he's not yet functioning as king. He's anointed priest, but he is functioning as priest. You see that? No man take this honor, but he that is called of God. Called of God and what? High priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, in the English language, and I've always said this, you know, as we study our Bibles, and if we have the ability, by the grace of God, look up words. Go back to the original. You see these two words that is here used as call? They are two different words in the Greek. But they use them in the English language as call. Now, if you don't go back to the Greek, you will, you will not get the full meaning of these two words call. This word call here is the Greek word kaleo. K-A-L-E-O. Kaleo. Call, meaning that you are called by name a high priest. 
This second word here, call, is a different Greek word. It means now that he is addressed as high priest. So in other words, he was named or addressed or saluted as high priest in this verse. But in this verse right here, he is appointed in office as a priest. So he is called or appointed. But when you get to verse 10, he is now addressed. Do you see the difference? He is called, appointed. But in verse 10, he's now addressed as high priest. In the, in the original, that's where you, found it. you find this. Destinated. Designated. Thank you. Designated. So he's, a, he's addressed. He's placed in office. So he is called. Then he is placed. Right? Now, I'm got, let, me, let, me, let me show you something here. Note this now. In the fourth verse, it has the simple meaning of being called or appointed. In verse 10, it means named or addressed or saluted or designated, as she says. As in recognition of an earned position or a title of honor. The application is to Christ taking his position at the right hand of God and being formally addressed by God as high priest. In verse 10, he's formally addressed as high priest. In verse 4, he is called into office. Now, let me make this more practical for you. When someone is running for presidency and he wins the presidency, what is he, sister? He's selected. What do we call him? President-elect. You see it? So Jesus, in verse 4, is called high priest elect. But then, after November, when you get into the new year, what do they do with the, pres the, the, the elect president? They swear him in, and what do you now call him? The president of the United States of America. Right? Because he is now a sitting president. So when you get to verse 10 now, he is now a sitting high priest. Do you see it, beloved friends? All right. Praise be to God. Now, let me, let me quickly bring this to a close. Aaron was called as, an, 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 a, 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 as the high priest in the type. He was Moses' brother, as we know from Exodus 4, verse 14. Now, look what the Bible says in Exodus 40, verse 13. And thou shalt put upon Aaron the holy garments and anoint him and sanctify him that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Now, for the purpose of time, I'm going to run by this because I see that my time is going. The high priest, we know, he must be unblemished. He, had, he was forbidden to marry, even a widow of that, and he must be a male. Now, here's something important that I want you to take note of. All firstborn, originally, belonged to God. All firstborn belonged to God. They were chosen by God. Firstborn of men and of beasts belonged to God. But I want you to know something very interesting that took place in Exodus chapter 13 verse 2. Notice what the Bible says here concerning the firstborn. Sanctify unto me all the firstborn. Whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of what? Man and beast. The firstborn of beasts was sacrificed to God and the firstborn of men were consecrated to God. You see that? Now, Exodus 32 it was where the shift took place. What happened in Exodus 32? The worshiping of the calf at the Mount of Sinai when Moses went for the law. You remember that event, right? Now, look what happened now. When the children of Israel went a whoring, God said to Moses, get thee down, for they have corrupted themselves. When Moses came down and saw what was happening in the camp, Moses said in Exodus 32, 26, Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of who? Levi came to Moses. So the sons of Levi came unto Moses. 
And as a result, they were rewarded. The priesthood. Because originally it was the firstborn. But after they apostatized at the foot of the mount, the sons of Levi got promoted. Look what it says now in Numbers 3.45. Take the Levites instead of who? The firstborn among the children of Israel and the cattle of the Levites instead of their cattle. And the Levites shall be what? Shall be mine. So the Levites graduated into the office of the priesthood because they were faithful. Now, there are two priesthood. Hebrews tells us that. Call of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He wasn't called after the order of the Levites. Now, why the order of Melchizedek? There are two reasons that I'm going to give you, but there are more. But in scriptures, we have this. For this Melchizedek was what? King and priest. You see, the Levites were not kings. They were only what? Priests. So Jesus could not come after the order of Levi because there was no kings in Levi. They were only priests. And Jesus has to be king and priest. But Melchizedek was king and priest. We find this in Genesis. We know that he was called king of Salem, priest of the most high God. When he met Abraham and Abraham paid him tithe, the Bible tells us he gave him tithe of all. Now, Paul picks this up in Hebrews, and I'm just going to run through this, right? He says, consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave tithe of all his spoil. So Abraham paid Melchizedek tithe. Now, let me continue now. The very, they that are of the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priest would have commandment to take tithe of the law. So in other words, the Levite received tithe. They don't pay our tithe. They receive tithe. But look what Paul says now as he makes the case. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed by the, the better. Then he says, and as may say, Levi also who received tithe, pay tithe in Abraham. How did the Levites pay tithe in Abraham? How did he pay tithe in Abraham? Think about it, beloved friends. Because there were no Levites yet. Remember, when Abraham met Melchizedek, there were no Levites. So how did the Levites pay tithe in Abraham? All right? You hear that, beloved friends? Because Abraham being the, for, the forerunner, that it would come through Abraham. And she is right because Paul makes that case to, 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 to help to amplify the priesthood of Melchizedek. Notice what he says here. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So in other words, remember, Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob had the 12 sons. So in other words, Paul is saying that Isaac, through whom Jacob came, through whom the Levites came, was in the loins of Abraham. So when Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek, the Levites were also paying tithe to Melchizedek because they were already in his loins. Do you see it, beloved friends? Now, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, there would have been no change. But it was faulty. Right? For the priest would be in change, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. What law? The Ten Commandments, right? What law? So the Levitical law, the ascension of the priest, or the law of the priesthood. The law of the priesthood had to be changed. Why does it need to be changed? Watch this now. For he of whom these things are spoken pertained to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. So in other words, how could Christ be a priest when his tribe, there was no one that functioned or officiate as priests in the Old Testament? So there had to be a change of the law of the priesthood. Watch now. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of where? 
Paul is making a case, beloved friends. He is making a case. Look now. And it is yet far more evident for after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another. Did you ever stop and think when Jesus said to the disciples in John 16, 12, I have many things to say unto you. But Jesus waited because he said that when the spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth. And that's what the spirit did. He guided them into all truth to let them know that, look, it is no longer after the order of the Levite. We are now changing that law. It is now the law of the priesthood of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, a better law. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and necessities. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat to offer. Jesus could not be a priest if he did not have anything to offer. What did he offer? Himself. His own blood. And that's why the Bible says no man in heaven was worthy to open the book. Only Jesus was worthy. I'm going to finish here. Because my time, my time is gone. My time is gone. And I don't have a lot of, I mean, I only have what? Let me, let me just finish this off. Let me finish it off. Let me finish it off. Go ahead, Elder. All right? Give, give my brother the mic, please. No, they want to hear you. Those online want to hear you as well. Please. Yeah. I humbly want to know, Pastor, what practical lessons I can take from all this. Because you, you have said a lot. Mm -hmm. There's so much to take in. But when I go out today, I'm facing a world of challenges. What okay. practical lessons can I take from your, your, your sermon today? All right. Practical lessons. What practical lesson can he take? Listen to this. Before Jesus was minister in the sanctuary in heaven, it must be dedicated. What do I mean by that? In Exodus, it was dedicated. Before, those who were ministering in the sanctuary, it had to be first anointed. Now, when Daniel picked this up in Daniel 9.24, when he talks about the anointing of the most holy, or the most holy, when it says 70 weeks is determined, most people link this anointing to Jesus' ministry. But Jesus even though he was anointed by the Holy Spirit, that word anointing in the Hebrew was never in context of an individual. It was always in context of a place or articles being anointed. And so when, 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 when Daniel said that 70 weeks are determined to anoint the most holy, that was in reference to anointing of the sanctuary in heaven before Jesus could minister in the sanctuary. I'm coming to your question, my brother. I, I haven't missed it. Now, the word anointing in the Old Testament can be applied either to objects or person in the expression most holy is nowhere applied to persons. The expression most holy in the Old Testament is exclusively used in connection with the object of the sanctuary or with places. Anointing of the Most Holy in Daniel 9.24 is in reference to the dedication of the heavenly sanctuary in its entirety after Jesus ascended to heaven in 31 AD. Now my brother asks the question, what can he get, what, what, what can he take with him? My brother, we have an high priest who is passed into the heavens. Jesus Christ the righteous. And the point that I have built here this morning is to show you for a surety that Jesus is not an imposter. He is not an imposter. The Bible clearly shows that there is a change in the priesthood. Jesus ascended to heaven. But before he could be function or before he could function as a priest, he had to first be anointed. And that is the reason why, you see, our people are not being taught. We have to be taught, beloved friends. That's why the Apostle Paul could make this statement when he says, 
For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So you can take with you this morning that you have a high priest in heaven that you can go on your knees and you don't have to pray to Mary. You don't have to pray to the pastor. You go on your knees and you pray to Jesus because he has appeared for us. So let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. I hope, my brother, that you will see this. Well, we need to be reminded. We need to be reminded. Because sometimes we come to church, we want to hear something new. But the Bible says that we must remind them of these, of these things. And we're living in an age where everybody wants to be original. Comes with something new. But when we know that we must come to the throne of grace. We can obtain mercy and find help in times of need. I hope and pray you have been blessed. And if you need more to be talked about, Elder, we can always have a conversation. Amen? Amen. Have you been blessed? Yes. Praise be to God. And from here on out, we are transitioning into the sanctuary. And I hope and pray that you will be here for the next episode. Bow your heads with me as we... Close off. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you that you have brought us to this point. You have showed us that you ascended to heaven, that you was anointed, that you are now functioning as high priest. We pray, dear God, as the scripture says, that we are to come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy. Find help in times of need. Lord, we are in that time of need. We need mercy. We need help. So we pray that as we leave here, dear God, we will leave with an experience to know that you will be with us and that we are to come and reason with you so that you can be to us what you was to Jesus Christ when he was here on earth. Is our prayer in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.